Welcome back to Computer File. You've got um, another story for us. Well, today I thought we'd talk about the great Morris Internet Worm of uh, 1988, which was a watershed moment in the history of the Internet. It was kind of a transitional event in the Internet history, because up till this point, it had all been a very uh, sort of academic network where we'd all got on very well, we'd all shared data, we'd all shared programs, we'd all sort of helped each other. And then uh, this event, which was actually, well, it was November the 2nd, 1988, so that's almost an anniversary now. At this point, I think there are around 60,000 computers on the internet, or the ARPANET as it probably was, it was sort of transitioning at that point. And uh, then this um, thing happened, and suddenly... Uh, a lot of computers found themselves under attack. And uh, this was a, a worm program that was moving around the internet and infecting computers. And it was helped quite a lot by the fact that everybody almost used the same computers at the time. Everybody was running on VAX computers pretty much, apart from a few Sun computers, which were also uh, coming into use. There were a few others, but because they're all using sort of the same computer, it was quite easy to attack. So uh, this thing was uh, appeared and people suddenly found them, all their computers um, crashing and all sorts of issues. The worm wasn't actually malicious, so it didn't come in and try and destroy anything. It was, ju it was a sort of, I think, somewhere between an academic exercise and a, and a sort of highlighting the security flaws. So it, it sort of moved around between machines. But the, the problem with it was that uh, it sort of infected a machine and then it tried to infect other machines and then it would infect another machine. But then that would come back and reinfect this one and it would get more and more copies of this worm running on the computer until eventually it just um, keeled over or just ran out of resources or, or whatever. So it, it used... Um, two or three different ways of attacking. So the first one was, uh, there's a very popular email program called Sendmail that Eric Holman wrote uh, for Berkeley. And that was used at a lot of computers at the time. It was fiendishly hard to configure, but once you got it configured, it was great and it dealt with all sorts of complexities. Uh, but it had a sort of back door in it that you could connect to it. And uh, there's a whole lot of verbs you could type in the SMTP dialogue but one of them was debug which wasn't a standard verb at all but allowed you to sort of switch into tracing and see what was happening and things like that but one of the things you could do there was run a program uh, by surreptitious means so this is what this worm did it it, it tried to connect to this uh, send mail port and immediately tried to switch into the debug and if it uh, if it was compiled with the debug switched on uh, then uh, it, it could access things and at this point um, people didn't really run binary distributions of computers you know like today you download a program and you just run it at that time you generally downloaded the source code and you looked at it and said um, oh it's got all sorts of options which of those do I want and you compiled it up and used whichever version you wanted so some people have got the debug built in because they thought it would be useful to work out what was going wrong because this were the early days and things were going wrong all the time at this point. So there's quite a few of those. Uh, another thing it used, there was a, a program called Finger, which worked best on um, multi-user programs. So this was a pro, uh, program you, you typed Finger, which sounds a bit dodgy, but um, anyway, it gave you information about a user. It's not very useful today because everybody's got their own computer. But uh, on those days, we had uh, you know, like big computers in the basement with maybe 40 or 50 terminals connected to it. And so you could see, find out information about other people in the department and say, you know, before walking around the department to see who was in, you could quickly see, are they in? Or have they been active? Right, it's a good chance to go and talk to them. Uh, so... When the internet started, people thought, oh, this might be nice to work between machines. So they, they had a sort of a daemon that just uh, would invoke this program and, and send you the results across the internet. So you could then say, OK, is 
Sean at Computer File Active today, and it would tell you yes or no. The flaw with this program was it used a very old library call called get s, which read a line from the terminal, which was fine. You just read in a line. But this one read it into a buffer, but it didn't say how big the buffer was. So you just gave it a buffer and said, read it into that. And it had no way of knowing when it was getting towards the end of the buffer. So typically people just declared a buffer that was big enough and hoped, hoped it would work. And this were a finger declared a buffer, I think, of 256 characters or something, which was fairly standard. Uh, but running under this finger D, if you sent 270 characters or something, you'd come off the end of the buffer and you'd start writing onto the stack. And if you placed the right instructions there, and this, this time you have to be very specific to the machine, so you place VAX instruction machine, uh, you could overwrite various bits of the stack and then when it returned, it would jump into whatever you wanted. So he planted a little bomb there that would jump into running a, um, a command interpreter and then broke into the machine. Once it was into the machine, it sort of copied itself in, it disguised itself, it deleted the original code so that you couldn't actually see it there and it disguised its name so it would appear as something else in the list of processes. And then it set about attacking other machines. So exploiting these two things but once it was onto a machine it would also look at um, there was a program called R shell which uh, has now been replaced by S shell or SSH uh, and that that allowed you to jump between machines if you had uh, uh, your account set up so it would start looking at accounts that it had got into and say oh could I use any of these it also had a set of passwords I think it had about 900 possible passwords that uh, it would try. It would also try the user's name as its password and user's name backwards as a password and see if it could uh, get into other machines like that. So it had two or three uh, tactics for getting around and uh, seemed to do extremely well. So it was written by Robert, I think it's Tappard Morris. He was a student at Cornell at this point. Uh, but he uh, hacked into MIT and released it from there uh, so that uh, uh, presumably to uh, uh, sort of disguise himself somewhat. Uh, awkwardly, his father, also called Robert Morris, was a uh, computer security expert, Oops. worked at uh, Bell Telephone Labs for some times, also worked at the NSA. So uh, I expect that was going to be a few awkward uh, conversations between father and son at uh, that point, uh, because it, it quickly, um, you know, spread throughout the internet, and they reckoned maybe six thousand computers were infected over this time. It took a couple of days to sort of remove it from each computer because it, uh, it kept reinfecting, and they weren't sure exactly what it was doing they managed to eventually capture one of these um, programs in the wild and disassemble it and work out exactly what it was doing and then they they, they could work out how to stop it uh, there was a very quick hack they found there was a program once it got in it tried to write to a temporary directory called user tump sh if there was was a file there it deleted it but it uh, didn't actually check to see if that was a file or a directory so if you created a directory user top sh that killed it so that was uh, one of the very early things that uh, people found that you could stop it and then um, you know eventually they they worked out what it was doing they uh, told everybody to recompile their send mails without the debug switch uh, delete the finger d thing and um, then gradually it sort of uh, managed to kill it off and uh, they stamped it out but uh, for a few days it was it was quite chaos and there was just you know messages on all the internet chat things and all the uh, news groups saying hell we're under attack what do we do and people cut themselves off from the internet which which was good but then they couldn't find the advice for how to stop it so you know then they put themselves back on to try and get an email out what are we doing how, how do we get so um, I guess there's a lot of phone calls and other things. This was a really big wake-up call for the internet. I mean, as I said, at this point, it'd been very much, you know, we're all sort of academics working together to try and get this internet to work and we're solving problems and so on and we're all helping each other. 
and it was a very sort of free and open culture. Uh, but this changed it in a big way very suddenly. So suddenly security was much more of a concern that uh, you know, they started to look at um, things. They, they have a set of uh, publications for Internet Standards called RFCs, Requests for Comments. And they started mandating that you uh, explore all the uh, security implications of any new protocol. And uh, suddenly everybody got very um, uh, serious about security from that point on. And uh, you know, that, that was kind of the transition from this sort of playground of fun and uh, frolics in the Internet to, oh, this is getting quite serious and, uh, you know, we we can't live without the internet now <laughs> and, and it's even you know it's obviously much more uh, relevant today but uh, we've come a long way since those days did somebody find out he'd done this or did he raise his hand and say oh, i'm really sorry yeah. one of his friends called the new york times and said um there's this virus on the loose or or this worm on the loose and um i it's, i don't think he actually said who it was but he did let slip the initials of, of the person. And it didn't take long for a report to work out that uh, yeah, RT, RTM was this uh, Robert Tappan Morris and uh, worked back and uh, worked out who it was. I think he'd gotten hidden by that point. Uh, he realised what, uh, what chaos he called and um, he was eventually convicted. got 400 hours of community service and a fine of $10,050. Significant at the time, I'm sure. Probably significant at the time, especially for a student who was uh, you know, in his first or second year of uh, university. Fame secured. He probably got some jobs uh, from then on in based on being the guy who did that. Yeah, I remember not long after. I mean, well, a few months after when you know, the, the uh, trauma had passed because it, it didn't actually affect us in the UK. We weren't uh, sufficiently well connected at that point. But people were discussing, would you hire the guy who wrote this? Because he's obviously quite skilled in that uh, you know, he's managed to break into uh, a good fraction of the computers. And uh, there's the some discussion on it. You know, Some people were still smarting from the blow and saying, absolutely not. It was horrible. And others were saying, well, you know, he has, he has some good skills. Um, directed in the right way, this, this would probably be a good thing to, uh, uh, to go for. So, uh, yeah, I, I think he has done reasonably well since, although I, I haven't actually followed what he did. I don't think there were many copycats of it at the time, although it did inspire things. I, I did actually have a go at writing something similar just to see what it was, but I was uh, fearfully careful not to let it run riot. Um, and, and there was only two computers it could infect anyway on, a, on our small campus. Uh, did it work? To a degree, it was, it was not nearly as uh, sophisticated as his. It was just a very simple script that copied itself around and sat around. But I made absolutely sure it, only one copy of it after a few experiments. I thought, oh, well, that, that's that. And uh, I'll delete it now before... Uh, <laughs> Moving <laughs> on. Yes, move on. It's purely sort of intellectual to say, oh, all right, I've never thought of how you could do that. Could you write a program that could copy its entirety somewhere else and then run it and so on. Of course, you know, we all know that's quite possible now. We've all had uh, experiences with worms that have infected Windows machines and things like that. This get s function is still available today, but I looked at the manual page and it says, do not ever use this function. Oh, really? This is purely here for backwards compatibility. Never, ever use this function. So. You only have to work out whether it's worth alerting the user if you find the key. So, you know, you download the temporary exposure key, you perform the, the encryption, you generate the potential RPIs and you compare them with the ones you've seen. And if or if you want a more slightly comprehensible message, it's saying maybe you haven't applied a function to enough arguments.